I think I pressed the live button correctly. Are we live? I think we're. I think we're live. Uh, Hooray! Yay! Hey, everybody, you know what to do. And they they have to say they have to say hello to me in the chat. And then if they say uh, hello to me in the chat, then I can then say hello back to them in the chat. Um, cool. So you've got uh, some kind of sound recording studio. Is that like your studio? Uh, you're yeah, in... this is my this is my studio in the background. I mean, this is a bit of a fake. There's actually only sound panels in that one little corner, but it's it's a very nice set. <laughs> <laughs> it just the it... rest is mostly covered in blankets, which do a similar thing, but they're much cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. I, I was actually pl I should do that because it definitely sounds a little hollow in here. I'm I, I need to sort of I think over the summer I'm gonna build more of a proper studio setup just because it's mm. it, it gets a little echoey and my computer is too close to my microphone and i need to get everything separated so well when, when we were at youtube i really enjoyed that little whispering booth that they had i've been considering investing in one of those what what was that it was like it was like a five by five like portable soundproof room mm. you just like take wherever you go it's right. very useful for me because I move around, right? So it's like right. It would be good for just doing the audio, right? Not doing yeah, yeah, yeah. It um, wouldn't be. I mean, unless you want to live in a box to do this kind of thing. Okay, I'm gonna say hi to a bunch of people. Hey, Alexis Displand, Arnold Post, Ben Aufa, uh, Benjamin Valamont, Burt Walters, B K Neshelm, Blair Pigeon, Brian Stab, Brian Cordova, Carolyn B, Citizen Gold, Connor Lennon, Darth Chocolate, mm, Chocolate, uh, Draw Curiosity. <laughs> Fur fur fur, <laughs> Giselle Saverin, Graham Walbridge, Guido Bibra, H. Roll, James Aberson, James Haney, Jarpet Singh, John Gallant, John Suffield, Johnny Zed. Yeah, I'm going to say Johnny Zed. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Lepree, K. Turob, Larry Beckham, Linda Sadek, Luke Pat, Malcolm Bond, Matt Minter, Michael Cassidy, Michael Jobin, Momo Dario, Nancy Graziano, Nichols of the Yard, Paul Gracie, Peter Houle. Philip Filbertus, uh, Arnstro, Rick Schwartz, S. Wahlberg, Stephen Hawkins. I don't know if I can do this every week now. Subject Line, <laughs> uh, Tech Tang, Thomas Traniker, Timothy Kuyper, Umu, William Vandebeek, and Zap Van Zap Van. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the weekly space hangout. We'll give uh, everyone like another two minutes to come in sit down uh i did one thing which was so if you maybe missed it, i did the the marathon on cosmos that's over on the twitch channel on f Kane. i don't know if it's still up but uh we spent uh 13 hours and uh watched every episode of cosmos and and did a live uh, commentary as we did um but uh i the stream was kind of clogging people's computers so i dan i decrease the speed so now i'm i'm uh, going out at three thousand kilobits per second as opposed to uh six thousand kilobits per second so hopefully it's still at 1080p but hopefully it's it's a little easier on everyone's bandwidth maybe uh i'm not complaining about too many viewers <laughs> i we can do this we can do this all day i can i can say your names every week eventually Phil it'll just be an hour of p of you saying names and yeah. then the stream will be over uh philip says that i always butcher your name every week philip phil berthus for phil phil berthus you're gonna have to like put it <laughs> phonetically if if i am gonna butcher it that's just how this has got to happen or just enjoy me butchering your name um my phone is ringing. Okay, why don't we uh, why don't we get started? All right. Um, I'm going to take you out of Brady Bunch mode, and we'll go to me, and we will begin. What the? Hold on. People can't see me. Oh no. That's okay. It's all right. We know what to do. Hold on. Hold on, everybody. There we go. All right. Uh, let us begin. And it's the 28th. Okay. 
Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Friday, April 28, 2017. I'm Fraser Kane, publisher of Universe Today. This week, we're going to be talking about the proposed next mission to Pluto. That's right. Alan Stern and the team are back to the drawing board, figuring out what's going to come next, as well as plans for a Europa mission to seek life under the ice. So we'll be uh, we'll be talking about those two things. Uh, joining me this week, we've got Jolene Creighton. Hasn't been here for a while. Jolene, welcome back. Hi, Fraser and everyone else. It has been months and months, like probably half a year at least, I think. Of Quite some time. Of course, uh, you are uh, the executive editor, the super in charge editor of Futurism. We, the... we call me the um, editor in chief, but I will be down with like super editor yep. or magical unicorn editor who yep. does science things, you know, whatever you want to call me really. I'm yeah. And I, I was easy. mentioning before the show, you guys are killing it, especially like your Instagram. Of course, you're verified. So you can actually like swipe up when you've got a cool story in Instagram and like go to your website. And, I, and we can't do that. Instagram. Yeah, we should. We I'll see if I can like get some contacts on at people. Yeah, yeah, please by all means. Uh, that'd I be will. Awesome. I will get yelling. All right. Yeah, sounds good. That'd be wonderful. All right, <laughs> and now uh, we've got a very special guest. We've got uh, my friend uh, from YouTube, my co-Canadian cohort, uh, Tim Blaze from Acapella Science. Tim, hey, how's it going? Welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout. Yeah, it's. Good. I didn't know that this existed until you told me about it. So it's yeah, it's, it feels like. It's like, oh, this could be a home. Like, I could, I could just hang out here, like in the chat every week. That sounds cool. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, they, they would be glad to have you. Uh, now, for people who, uh, who don't know, can you give just the, your, uh, your introduction? Who are you? What do you do? I am, I'm Tim Blay. Um, I, so I live in Montreal, and I make science a cappella videos. I have a background in like theoretical physics, so I did a master's in high energy theory at McGill. <laughs> And then I decided that instead of cramming myself into the world of physics, I would burst out and explore the world of musical science. So I, I made the, so now I make these acapella videos where I, I'll take a very complicated topic and try to synthesize it in short rhyming stanzas that have nice rhythms and harmonies. And it's a very constrained problem, but people seem to like it. So here I am. Yeah, absolutely. About five years now I've been doing this. And so we we actually spent uh, the better part of a week together in Toronto yeah. with a bunch of our Canadian, other Canadian YouTubers uh, who are on the rise. There was a magician and a DJ and uh, makeup people and dancers and uh, sort of they were all sort of channels in Canada in between 10,000 and 100,000 and they let us use their gear and they uh, gave us, you know, let us meet with experts and teach us a bunch of stuff. And at the same time, we all started planning out collaborations. So um, yeah. it was a really, it was a really good time. And actually, I was on your podcast you were yeah you were on the the little podcast that i run with my roommate uh, yeah. up for discussion yeah which was fun yeah and that I was just, that I, was a super fun conversation and uh what's what i love is you're hilarious but also very you know you know your science stuff so you you just make you make the weirdest most obscure <laughs> but you know technically scientifically correct uh jokes yeah i like to I like I like to hide things in there for that one person who's like struggling. They're like in their fifth year of a PhD and they've been dealing with this one topic for like five years and then they come across my video and no one else gets the joke, but <laughs> they do. And it gives light to maybe to their life in a place of dark PhD writing. That's 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 like my fantasy. When I, <laughs> well, when I write those jokes, that's like the little place that I go into like, mm. so I'm so I'm going to do something. I'm going to sort of channel my uh, my inner talk show host here. And I'm going to I'm going to queue up. A, we're going to queue up a clip. All right. So um, the clip is going to be um, from your channel. I hope I'm not going to get some kind of copyright. Do you promise not to, to send in a copyright strike against me if I run this I, clip I from your show? I won't ding you, but I can't necessarily say the same thing about Disney. So, I mean, it's up to you. Well, if they, have they d dinged you yet? Yeah, yeah. They, they tend to be. Uh, I got it on that. If you're, you're doing the, the exoplanet yeah, video, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I put that up and 
Disney, like I just got this wall of like, this is claimed by 40 different companies. Wow. But they, I mean, they keep it up. They, it's not like they. Yeah. They so I, so I might have to give anything, up all the advertising but... on this, on this episode of the weekly. It, it, it's worth it to me. Let's do it. All right. Yeah. I'm ready. Uh, okay. So why don't you tell people what this is that we're about to watch? Um, so this is, uh, my, my latest video. It's, um, an Aladdin history of exoplanets. Um, titled Whole New Worlds, which I thought was a, that sounds good. a little pun. But right. basically, yeah, it goes right back into the history of how we went from knowing only these eight or nine, depending on your, your bent, little planets around our sun to knowing thousands of planets throughout the universe. All right. So we'll watch like a couple seconds of it and see what happens. Cool. I look forward to my copyright claims. <laughs> New world. That's what we I'm looking for one tug, pull of a planet, one tell, a wobbling sun. I've searched for years, haven't found a one. But they're out there. One jumped in radio redshift, one slipped the spectral lines. They'll see if I can show them the signs. Pish tush. Green men. Take five, take ten. Just a little cash, guys. Take a hint, better face the facts. Second hand will have to do. All right, I'm gonna. That's that's as much as I can do before they. Uh, I can I can feel hear the lawyers knocking on the front door right now. So, uh, that was great. So, I mean, a lot of your stuff is. I mean, you've covered a bunch of topics, right? But a lot of it does move towards the science and and astronomy side. A lot of missions. Is yeah. that your? You know, is that your favorite topic? The one you know I most feel about. Like it just kind of, it lends itself well. Like every science mission kind of has a natural um, arc to it, like a, like a story, right? There's, there's kind of a thread you can follow that in a lot of other fields of science, it's a lot messier to try and figure out a, a narrative to go through it. So I think probably that's why, especially I end up doing a lot of space things combined with Disney or like um, narrative type things. It just, it just sort of fits well, I think. Um, but I don't. I don't really know. I I keep I keep getting good space ideas, and so I keep doing them. But it's sort of accidental. Like I started out with all my good theoretical physics ideas, and then I kind of I played that out, and I'd lost. You know, there were only a certain number of things I was an expert on, and I did all those. And then I sort of went to the next thing that I nerd out about, and I guess that's space. I think I'm sort of trying to move into other things like biology and psychology and stuff, and, and expand because now I feel like. Like I, I have a chance to actually grow the frontiers of what I can know and what I can geek out about. But those take a lot more time. If you're already a space nerd, then space things come pretty natural. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I, it's the same thing for me, right? Like when I'm writing some of the scripts for some of my episodes and I really know the material, it just tumbles right out of my head. I have to look up a couple of dates and a couple of numbers, but the, the underlying concepts are fairly straightforward. But if I had to do, say, you know, you did an episode on CRISPR, which, yeah, you know, that was, that was a headache. That one took forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because it was it, like you delve into, it, it seems like everybody on YouTube put out CRISPR videos at the same time which means that all of us were researching independently and, and not having, usually the first thing I do is that I go on YouTube and I find the people who have already explained it because often they've done it really well. And for a long time, there was just nothing on CRISPR. So I actually, I ended up getting the help of Joe Hansen from say, uh, it, It's Okay know, to Be Smart because yep. he's, he's got a PhD in, uh, in microbiology. So I, I was chatting with him for a long time being like i don't understand what, <laughs> what these what are these insane acronyms and yeah. you know what's a ribonucleoprotein and it, he sort of guided me through but it, yeah it's a much longer process yeah Kur kurzgesagged i always get it say it wrong course, but i don't know Kur yeah. Kur no no not gonna try no but I'm they just... did a great they did a great one too and you know everything was animated which was which was fantastic so they did that like a week before i put out my video and <laughs> oh, i was really no. mad at them oh, i thought no. i was gonna get the scoop but yeah. as it turned out it made it made made it so that people understood my song a lot better so right we and all you... kind of work with each other i think yeah and you're able to kind of come along for the ride as they put out their super popular videos yeah uh, so let's talk just a bit about the creative process right like 
those take a tremendous amount of work, right? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the creative process is like a surprising amount of the work is usually just research. Like it's like you said, I feel like I I have to know about twenty times more about a subject than is actually going to go into the song because it's such a cons constrained problem to write a song that like accurately explains what's going on. Um, I I just need at my disposal every possible fact and concept and keyword that I can get in order to even solve that little puzzle. So usually it's like several weeks of um, starting with Wikipedia and then going to the bottom of the page and following the rabbit hole of links to various journals and seeing which ones I can get for free. Um, and then, <laughs> you know, just, just slowly banging out a set of lyrics. And then, yeah, like everything, I'm the only person working on this project. So it's just, you know, you step from one thing to the other. So after you've got, you know, three weeks or so of writing, then I've got to arrange the whole thing. And generally, generally I don't particularly arrange. I just start singing into my computer and like what I like, I keep. And then I just sort of, I, I build it by singing and I arrange it while I construct it. And then there's the whole lengthy shooting process. Right. Yeah, so you've gone together. and yeah. like actually laid down the tracks for the, for the songs. And then you have to actually shoot a video that, that lines everything up. Yeah. And then I've, I've been trying to figure out how to, how to make everything work with everything else. So, so that's not just redundant information, right? Because what I used to do was I would, I would sing and then, I would just represent like exactly what I was singing on the screen, but that's a real waste of space, right? There's, there's, there's the visual and the auditory. There's, you've got these two bandwidths coming at you at the same time. So I'm, what I'm trying to do now is more um, tell part of the story with the, with the visuals and part of the story with the lyrics. And um, you know, so people can sort of take it in fully, but it's, yeah, it's a interesting challenge, I guess. But it's such a different, I mean, I think you're on a different cadence than I think the rest of us YouTubers, right? Where, where for us, the message is just more and more faster, faster, uh, turn these things around very quickly. But I mean, what's your release schedule? My, I mean, it's, it's about once every two months, yeah. but yeah, I, I like, be, because of that, I can't really do the, the chase the story, right? If yeah. I chase a story, then I'm a month out of date. Um, but I, I actually really like that because it lends me to more of a step back and consume an entire field and then find an interesting thread within that field and, um, you know, construct something um, slowly, but, but hopefully in a, in a sort of loving way that really does justice to the, the topic as a whole. Because I, I get really annoyed with... Like, I, I don't know how I would avoid doing the thing that a lot of sort of popular science websites fall into where they just report whatever it is as soon as it comes out because they need to get your eyeball before the next person. I, if I was able to do that, I don't I, like, it seems like the end result of that game is less and less fact checking and more and more. Well, people angry in the comments under the Facebook posts yeah. and stuff. Um, uh, so, you know, specifically, let's talk about your, your physics background. So you're working in, was it high energy physics? Where were you? Yeah, I mean, it's high energy theory. Basically, it's, it's mostly string theory, but it's string theory and other types of quantum gravity stuff. So it's, it's basically everything that can't be proved and no one has any idea how to go about proving it. They, they lump it all into high energy theory. And then it's, so it, it's almost, it's half pure mathematics and half, well, pure mathematics pretending that eventually it'll make contact with the physical reality of the universe. And so it's, it's a lot of puzzles. It right. feels like very complicated games that and you're you playing. And you went up to, you, you got your master's degree, right? Yeah, yeah. So I was, my thesis was on these, you, these like theoretical universes that only have two dimensions um, and are sort of wrapped up on themselves. So they're wrapped up in like torus donut shapes or like, multi multi handle bodies is what you call them so if you imagine like one of those inner tubes that you see at a at a water park that fits like four people it's got that kind of pretzel shape that's like the shape of the universe that we were studying and we were just trying to figure out how, could you figure out a sensible way for gravity to exist in that kind of universe and we came up with some result and i i don't know probably like two people will read it and put it in their own um 
in their own stuff. But obviously it doesn't apply to our universe because our universe has three dimen- well, three space dimensions and is not shaped like an inner tube. So, uh, And I mean... I mean, the Large Hadron Collider is still kind of moving along, and I'm sure you're. I mean, are you staying on top of the discoveries and the and the work that's that's coming out of the LHC? I wish I. Uh, I one thing that I miss is that, like, when I was in academia, I felt like I was constantly just awash in in you know rumors about what was coming down the pipe, and now the only version that I get of that is when it comes out into some sort of popular science um, website, but. It seems with the LHC recently, it's just like, you know, every once in a while they'll get a bump and they'll say, ooh, maybe it's a particle. Right. And then everybody will write a lot of papers about if it's a particle, this is what it means. And then they do more data and it turns out that it's not a particle. It's, so I've, I don't know, has anything, has anything really phenomenal come out of the LHC since like 2012? Well, not, I mean, since the Higgs boson, I mean, there have yeah. been, I mean, I think there've been other, as you say, bumps and other particles, but I mean, mm-hmm. the the next big step is they're trying to search for, they're looking for evidence of supersymmetry and so far that right. still, that still hasn't turned up yet. Well, that's the, the thing with supersymmetry is that it's, there's no reason, it's a solution to a problem, but there's no reason to propose, to suppose that it has to be the solution to the problem because it's, it's a very theoretical problem, right? It's the question of, why isn't why isn't there an insane amount of energy at every point in space that causes it to fold up on a singularity and the entire universe collapse into a black hole? That's not happening. And it seems like it should happen. And one of the ways for it not to happen is to make everything um, super symmetric so that all there's a bunch of positive energies in the vacuum and a bunch of negative energies in the vacuum and they just cancel out. You get no energy and you get flat space. Um, but there's no reason why that should be the answer it's just a way to get zero energy and another way to get it is to just say well i guess that's how it is Um, but you would sort of need a theory of quantum gravity to to know what the right solution is because the like supersymmetry is very motivated by string theory because you sort of need string theory you you need supersymmetry for string theory to work but string theory there's also no reason to suppose that it's the right answer to quantum gravity so it's it's more like we're just we're looking for the best idea that we have, but there's always a very strong possibility that we just haven't thought of the right idea. I mean, this has been a tricky one. Uh, all of the other forces have been brought together uh, yeah. in the first moments of the universe, but gravity continues to to elude. And uh, well, it's it's just so far out of out of our energy scales, right? Like you need to you need to be basically you need to be creating tiny little black holes to see whether quantum gravity works. And, you know, aside from the people who thought that the LHC was going to create tiny black holes that were then going to swallow the globe back when the, the LHC started. And people, you forget that that was like a real concern that the public had for a while. Like, Oh no, what if we kill the world? Um, there's like, you would, you would have to build a collider as like as wide as the galaxy to get up to those energy scales. So like you're left at a place where there's no way for reality to lead you towards the right theory, which is what used to happen in science, right? It was always, oh, we can't explain this phenomenon. And then someone comes along with a theory that explains it. But now it's like we've, we, can, we can explain all the phenomena we know about, but the, the theories don't play well with each other. And so nature doesn't give us any sort of direction of where to go. So the LHC is more just stabbing around in the dark, hoping for something curious that it can grab onto. And the problem is that it just keeps finding nothing. Right. Oh, <laughs> uh, hold, hold on one second. Radar Man is trying to sleep in the chat, so we should be really quiet. He's trying to sleep? Yeah. Shh. Is it, is it better if I talk like this? Yeah, I Radar think that's Man? better. Is that better? Yeah. Oh, great. Cool. Good night, Radar Man. All right. Uh, well, I'm interested. Um, so, uh, like, I, it feels like, I mean, just like it just feels like, like, just in general, like, on the one hand, we're seeing all these scientific things moving forward. We're seeing, you mm-hmm. know, we've got these amazing phones and we've got all of this wonderful technology. And then, and, and yet at the same time, I mean, I mean, watching Cosmos just earlier this week on this marathon, I was expecting a lot more of the science to be really different and to be mm-hmm. vastly updated. But the kinds of things that Carl Sagan was talking about, he said the universe was 15 billion years old as opposed to the 13.8 billion year more modern number that we have. But... Right. But in general, the kinds of topics 
in the kinds of, of our understanding of the universe was very similar. And yet I know, you know, physicists and theorists have been really working quite hard over the last almost 40 years since Cosmos came out right. uh, to advance these these underlying theories. And maybe the Higgs boson is the is the big one that's come up. But apart from that, uh, but even the even the Higgs, like the Higgs was known about since the 60s, right? It had been theorized. Yeah. So it was a very boring result. Like everyone was kind of secretly hoping when the LHC turned on that they wouldn't find the Higgs. Yeah, because that would just, you know, that would just be fascinating. It's like, well, what now? Yeah, that but, would be interesting. Yeah. But I, I think like, like you can, you're still seeing progress in the the, the more application side of science because there's like there's a big difference between exploring the why of like what's underneath this level of a thing we understand and exploring all the things that that level of understanding allows so like the theoretical physics especially the high energy stuff they're really concerned with okay we're going to go a deeper level and a deeper level and get down to like what's the fundamental thing but at the same time like you people haven't even solved the, the equations for how water flows around like there are fundamental problems <laughs> yeah. with like what why do we sleep can, like do, it's it's an open problem in physics whether water can explode spontaneously like people actually don't know this like it's it's like the the singularity problem of the navier stokes equations is what it's called and, and, the problem and water that, could like, explode? Well, it it seems that it doesn't, but no one can mathematically prove that it it couldn't. So, like, and and the the the, the equations for water are two hundred years old, and people are still sorting out these you know the results of those equations. So then you talk about quantum mechanics, and we haven't even solved everything that you can do with a transistor, and that's just one tiny bit of what quantum mechanics can give you. So, I think. Like there's there's much further you can go sort of exploring upwards into the the solutions of all these equations we're finding. But as as but in terms of getting down to what are the equations below these equations, that's a much different puzzle. Right, right, right. Yeah. And uh, but it is I mean, is it just a matter of bigger tools now? I mean, do you think we need the to bring back like the superconducting super collider? Do we need a more advanced version of the of the LHC? Well, it's hard to tell, right? Like if the LHC doesn't find anything, then it's it's like it's like you're wandering say you're wandering around in the dark and someone tells you you're in a room that's somewhere between 5 meters wide and 500 miles wide. How long should you expect to keep walking before you hit a wall? It's like you have no idea. So if you don't find anything after 25 meters, maybe you could walk to 30 meters and maybe you'll hit, maybe the wall will be there, but maybe you've got a, another 500 kilometers to go. And that's the situation that you're at with just upping the energy of these colliders. It's like, it's a, it's a massive cost to humanity to build these things. And it's very hard to convince say funding agencies and politicians that you should go that extra, say, 25 meters when potentially you have all the way up to the Planck scale, which is where, where you need colliders the size of the galaxy to see anything. It could be that there's nothing right up until that point. So it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a little bit of a depressing situation, to be honest, in, in theoretical physics. But at the same time, like, there, there keep coming down interesting things that are um, at least viable alternatives to string theory that are starting to come out now in high energy theory and that i find interesting because at least you're at least you're exploring the parameter space i feel like for a long time people were stuck in this idea that string theory was the answer if we could only solve it um and string theory still isn't solved so like there's you know 10 to the 500 different universes that it predicts so it's hard to investigate every one of them <laughs> But at least I think people are coming to the conclusion that, okay, it's been 30 years. Let's maybe try some different directions and some new ideas. Um, so that's that's a little promising anyways. And I mean, some way that you could eventually get at actually being able to test them. I mean, that's the big problem with, with string theory is that the the resolution of the uh, of the of these strings, their size is beyond the limits of any kind of method of of testing, and so it's just yeah. So that's the problem. Is fantasy, that right? E well, ev yeah. Even if you found a, a string theory universe that was exactly our universe, you wouldn't have a way to tell whether string theory was true 
because it would just predict exactly the things that we already see in our universe that are already predicted by other theories. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a faith thing at that point. It's like, do you believe in string theory becomes like, do you believe in an omnipotent God that doesn't interfere with the universe? It's like, well, you can't tell the difference. <laughs> so, um, so we've got a couple of questions that are coming in here from the, uh, from the audience. Uh, this comes from our Joan. Uh, do you think that universal understanding is getting away from us, meaning that we could be reaching the limit of human understanding and we have to rely on machine learning for future science? Well, it's possible, right? Like there's, there's no reason to suppose that we can access the fundamental limits of, of what reality is. Like it's, people often say that mathematics is already sort of unreasonably effective in describing the universe. Like it's, there was no reason from the outset to propose, to suppose that the universe was going to be mathematical. It just is. And it's cool that it is. Um, but it might, yeah, it might be that there's just like, there's just this level. And then the next level is way, way, way down there um, where there's just no way that we could access it without being, you know, a class four civilization with, you know, multi-galactic abilities um i don't the thing is that in that case like machine learning can take us further but it it might be that even the machines we can construct just you know just keep drilling down and keep finding nothing new well and also the problem with with these kind of machine learning is sometimes you can't understand the machine can't describe to you what it has learned and so you've right. got these situations where you've got you know, Google is feeding text into into its machine learning programs, and it is starting to make decisions, but there's no way for us to understand the decision making process that's going on. So it could very you well can... be that the, you know, you set up these computers, and they create some kind of, you know, you know, some amazing particle accelerator, and it makes discoveries and and but it can't even tell us how and why. It's right, able but at least at least there would be more information. You can imagine maybe an iterative process where then you make a machine to interpret that machine to you, right? So like like people with with AlphaGo, right? So there's there's this AlphaGo program that's now beyond the abilities of all professional Go players. It's yeah. just creaming them, and. But the interesting thing is that there are all these commentaries coming out on the internet of people actually analyzing its strategies, and they're actually coming to to new insights. Like it's not just a black box, even though it can't tell them what it's doing. The fact that it shows them something that works, all of a sudden there are a bunch of new clues that you can go and look at if you're smart enough, because it's still only just a little smarter than a person. So the, a person can look at it and say, oh, that that worked. It's kind of, it's kind of how creativity works, right? Like someone comes up with an idea that they've never heard of before. They can't tell you how they came up with it, but you can see that it's a good idea and you can go for it, even though you couldn't come up with it yourself. So like that's, I, I, I think that artificial intelligence, if it didn't destroy us in all of the possible ways that it could destroy us could actually be a fairly, it, it's a way to extend ourselves that is, it's not intractable. Right. Yeah. Especially if you get sort of nested levels. Um, the uh, and if you want to hear more on this topic, uh, Tim and I go in quite a lot of detail on your podcast, and we we, we do. Talk although about we aliens. I think af afterwards we ended up talking for about half an hour that we didn't record because we weren't done. Right? Oh, really? I thought yeah, we had the we whole just, thing in there. Okay, yeah. We, we just sat sat in the hallway and we talked about <laughs> what, was, what was it? Your your theories ab about why it's it's definitely true that we are alone in the universe. Yeah, um, yeah, my my, my boring. I've yeah, they they all know the the the, the viewers all know my my. Well, I was I was pretty fascinated by that on so. uh, on the Fermi paradox. But uh, so just let's do a, a couple of plugs here, and then we're gonna switch to the news portion. Uh, one, what are you working on right now? What what is the next episode gonna be? Okay, so well, the next. Uh, actual video of mine is coming out in a couple days and it's it's going to be completely going off of the the space and physics track it's explore it's just exposing the the evidence and sort of modern day knowledge of ornithology and particularly like bird evolution so how it is that we know that birds are dinosaurs because i was also a, a big dinosaur kid when I, so i just sort of go with my interests um, but the other the other fun thing that I'm doing is that I've started doing like I started doing a, a science interview series as well. So I just put up a video on my channel 
where I interview Jamie Matthews, who's at, at UBC, actually. Mm -hmm. And he's the, the most... guy who... Yeah, the most guy. Yep. He launched the, the Humble Space Telescope, yep. as people like to call it. And he's a, a, he's a really quirky, interesting guy. Um, yep. He just... He, he looks like a supervillain <laughs> if you look at him. <laughs> well, maybe um, he's changed he's, since I used to hang out with him. He was, you know, I think I hung out with him about 20 years ago. So he's mm. a supervillain now. It's, uh, it's an interesting yeah. development. And I, I've, got, I've got one coming up as well with uh, Richard Prum, who's the Yale ornithology professor. Um, and we go really into detail about, about like birds being dinosaurs and also some interesting um, sort of game theory stuff ab about sexual selection in terms of evolution and how it is that we are kind of created by intelligent minds. They're just the intelligent minds of our ancestors that were picking their mates and stuff. So yeah, I, it's, it's kind of a cool concept. So, okay. So that's what your, that's what your next, I guess your next interest is going to be and the, and the results of all this. And I like this idea of you doing these, these additional videos surrounding the topic that you're doing to kind of. Yeah. Know, give... Well, it's a way for me to learn too, because like it, I, like I said, I've sort of been feeling unplugged from academia and this is a way for me to like, number one, be explaining to people all of the stuff that ended up on the cutting room floor that I couldn't put in my very limited stanzas of information and also just to do my own research because, you know, I get to talk to a Yale ornithology professor and yeah. all of a sudden I, you know, I have this raw access to I'll answer all the questions that I've been Googling for weeks and haven't come up. So yeah, it's, it's I think it's going to be good. Uh, but and just, I've been finding that I consume a lot more conversations nowadays. So. And so just to, I'm just going to bring up your uh, channel again here on the, on the browser. So it's acapella science. Yep. And uh, yeah, you got uh, lots of videos, lots more coming. They've got a whole thing on Pluto Mars, yeah, if, Outbound if people, Probe. If, yeah, the Outbound Probe, that's the one about the New Horizons probe yep. back in the day. So if, if people go back into the history, you've got a good amount of content to watch if you've never heard of me. So. Yeah, totally. Okay. Um, and uh, where else can people find out more about you? Um, well, I've if you go basically on any platform, I'm Acapella Science. Um, with one P, which is a slightly aberrant spelling of acapella, which I like to say is Latin, but more is just that I misspelled it, and now I don't want to change it. So <laughs> acapella, <laughs> acapella science um, on on Twitter, on Instagram, on Snapchat, on Facebook. Yeah. Um, you can find me at all all those places. So yeah, but awesome. YouTube is the main spot. Okay, you, great. You know, so subscribe, hit the notification button. Do it. Whatever. Subscribe. Yeah. You won't. Uh, and and your podcast. And what was the yes. name of the podcast? One and more the, time for the people. The podcast is is called Science Life. So you can that that's also I'm putting that on the YouTube channel, but yep. you can also find it on basically every podcast app. Fantastic. So, yep. All right. So now now normally I let people go free, but you elected to stick around and uh, and uh, chat about the the news topics of the week. So uh, yeah. Well, I'm interested in what you have to say, but I'll try to take a back seat. Well, we'll see. I may I may get your uh, I may get you to to chime in as we go, but. Uh, Let's uh, let's rope Jolene into it. Uh, before we move on to the uh, to the news portion, I just want to, as always, say a big thank you to the Weekly Space Hangout crew. These are the people who uh, really organize the sort of behind the scenes, choose our guests, uh, and help out. So down here, you can see that. Uh, that chat that's going on there, that's part of the Weekly Space Hangout crew. Just go to wshcrew.space and you'll find out information and you can find out how to get into the chat that's going on, the Slack chat that's going on down here. And then I'm in there, Dr. Pamela Gay's in there, a bunch of the uh, the Weekly Space Hangout uh, regulars are in there and you can just chat with us. So, all right. Uh, Jolene, let's uh, let's start with the with the super cool news, which is uh, what's going on with uh, the next New Horizons. Uh, so yes, New Horizons, uh, fantastic, amazing. It was by far the defining uh, astronomical event of my lifetime. I mean, I was not around for the moon landing, sadly. Um, and so New Horizons, uh, in case you don't know, launched in about 2006, and it took a 10-year trip to get to Pluto. Uh, the principal investigator of the mission is Ellen Stern, who uh, works at NASA. And this week, he got together with a bunch of scientists in Houston to start talking about New Horizons 2.0. Uh, I am in favor of that name, but it's so super early that we have no idea what the name of the mission would actually be. 
Uh, basically, they were talking about going back to Pluto because there's just a lot of stuff. I mean, New Horizons is fantastic. It's our first close look at, at Pluto, but there's a lot of stuff that we missed on that path. Uh, so Ellen Zorn, um, and other uh, scientists at NASA and around the world want to get another mission together in order to uh, get closer and um, observe a lot of things that we missed, basically. Yeah, it's it's funny. I'm I'm just showing uh, the tweet that Alan Stern shared, showing the team coming together to talk about what this next uh, what this next one might be. And many of the people in these pictures have been here on the show, which is great. So uh, it shows. Yeah, it's actually. I was just gonna say it's actually funny. Like social media. Uh, that's how I found out about it as well. Because I well Facebook. I'm friends with. Uh, Alan, I saw him post the same yeah, picture on Facebook. That, and like, that's yeah, how fantastic. we jumped on it too. So we saw yeah. his his tweet talking about uh, about how they're working on a on a potential lander and an orbiter, and then we jumped on the story and and got some yeah. information together as well. So so give us. I mean, it's still in the early pre preliminary stages. What yeah. is the idea that they've put forward so far? Uh, so basically what they want to do is uh, send an uh, orbiter back so that they can get a full view of Pluto uh, because New Horizons went by and we only saw one side of the planet. So obviously we want to be able to see the, the full planet. Um, the other thing uh, that they would like to do is uh, get closer to some of the moons. So Pluto has a host of moons. There's Nix, Hydra, um, Charon. How do you say that? Sharon, is that how you pronounce it? Sharon, yep. Sharon, yep. Uh, and uh, we got some pretty good images of Sharon, but Nixon Hydra, we really didn't. They're like still terribly blurry. Uh, so get better views of the moons. And then the current resolution, um, it's about 230 feet per pixel. Uh, what they would like to do with this next mission is get as close uh, so we can see 30 feet per pixel. And the idea, uh, again, super, super early, but basically would be to put uh, orbiter around to stay in orbit for um, three or four years, uh, which would allow us to collect so much more data because New Horizons was a flyby mission, so it just zoomed right by. Um, but yeah, assuming that this, this mission does come to fruition, I'm guessing we probably wouldn't be getting there until mid 2030s, like the absolute earliest. Well, the, um, I mean, part of the idea is is having a fairly fast way to get there. So they're going to put it, they're probably going to put it on an SLS. Ah, uh, yeah. Right? Would, yeah. And so, and so um, that's going to get it there in a reasonable amount of time. And then one of the other ideas is they're thinking about using a, um, uh, an RTG, like a radio thermo electric generator uh, as a power source, but using an ion drive from that, which has, which has sort of never been done yet. We've had some ion engines that have gone out there, but we haven't had ones, they've been sort of solar based, but to have one that's actually run by by an RTG is a pretty interesting way to do it. And so you would get, again, sort of a a lot of thrust. So, yeah, because Pluto, uh, well, not Pluto, uh, New Horizons took a decade to get there. But of course, since it launched in 2006, our technology has advanced significantly since then. So, yeah, we could um, get there significantly quicker. Um, but just, you know, gosh, that's one of the things about, like, I love NASA, um, but because it's a government agency, uh, all these projects and missions, you know, new administrations come on, and so stuff gets fixed and changed. Um, so the planning stage alone usually takes a while, but hopefully Alan Stern can make it happen because he is so passionate. Um, and I've seen yeah. him speak a number of times and like spoken with him and he's just so passionate about this. Um, and one of the things that the mission to Pluto really did um, is I think in, the, in much the same way, the first moon landing uh, inspired a generation. Uh, it, it did the exact same thing, you know, from, from millennials. Uh, it really showed us, uh, what we can accomplish and how far we can go, literally like 4 billion miles from Earth. Uh, when scientists come together, we come together and, and, you know, 
work together. Yeah. So. One of the other really exciting ideas for this one is uh, there's, a, there's a thing called the, uh, the direct fusion drive, which is actually in the, uh, the advanced NASA's advanced uh, concepts group. And it's sort of in the early stages. And so one of the ideas is to use this direct fusion drive on this mission and maybe do the flight time in just four years. So, so, and give it a lot more capability when it gets there. But this is all still way in the test, uh, in sort of in the, in the test range so far. So, um, it's a pretty, I mean, what do you think, Tim? Would you, uh, if you had sort of a set amount of resources, would you go back to Pluto with a, with a lander and an orbiter? Or are there other places that you think maybe should be visited first? Well, the one question I have is how are they going to slow down? Like if they want to put something in orbit, the problem with the last one was that even even taking that long to get there, it just whizzed right by. Um, so do, do you know how they're planning to do that? Uh, well, it, I mean, it would just be the the thrust of this. So So they would probably have to do some kind of, you know, do like some kind of home and transfer, but then also break in the opposite direction. Because normally, mm -hmm. right, normally when they do a, a home and transfer, they, they aim for where it's going to be, they raise their orbit, and then the orbit crosses at the exact moment that the planet is there. And that mm -hmm. is the minimum energy to get you to that target. But you yeah. can, you could use more energy to get to your target more quickly, but you will have to then, you know, decelerate on the other side as well. So yeah, it's just and a the matter problem of the problem with decelerating is that as soon as you decelerate, you add the mass needed to decelerate, and then the rocket equation blows up in your face, and yeah. you need an exponentially larger rocket to get you going. So, and you know, in some cases, they can do things like aerobrake, uh, but you know, Pluto doesn't have a thick enough atmosphere to really allow some kind of aerobrake. So, yeah. I mean, these are all still the details that we're, that are going to have to be worked out. But would you go? Would you go to Pluto? Is there somewhere where you would rather go first? I mean, frankly, I, I want to go to Europa before I go pretty much anywhere else. Um, I'm, I'm really hoping for that, that deep sea ice drilling and mm -hmm. all sorts of alien squids and whatever else it is. Um, maybe it's just the fact that I read a lot of Arthur C. Clarke when I was young. But um, that's, I mean, if, if you had to pick one mission, I, I would say Europa. Yeah, well, I mean, also, let's, that's a given, though. Let's, we'll, we'll, yeah. That one's already in the, in the, in the can, so... so. Yeah but now in sort of proposed missions. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of the star shot too. So are we proposing yeah. that that's on the table? <laughs> sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And that, yeah. If uh, the thing is that if you can get the star shot, maybe you get Pluto for free because you can, you know, then you can get there in like five seconds. Yeah, absolutely. And that's been sort of mo one of my g great recommendations is like this idea of the project star shot is wonderful and boy, it would be amazing to send a spacecraft to to another star. But that technology alone would be great for just exploring the solar system. Like, why yeah. do we have to to go to another star? Why don't we use this to just explore all the worlds in the solar system simultaneously, without yeah, I, a lot of the dangers of trying to cross interstellar space? So I'm I'm on board. Let's mm -hmm. get her done. I mean, yeah, that that feels like. It's almost like you would, you would have to do that first as a test run, right, to see if this technology works. Probably try to send it to Pluto before you try to get it all the way to Alpha Centauri. Yeah. So maybe that's the way to go. Um, all right, Jolene, let's go on to your, uh, to your next story. All right, so the next one is a proposed mission, a new proposed mission to go to Europa, which is also in its super, super, super early works. Uh, Michael Blunt from France's Research Institute in Astrophysics and uh, Planetology proposed a plan this week about a joint effort between NASA and the European Space Agency to get a lander on Europa uh, and to launch it in the mid-2020s. So NASA already has plans, as Fraser mentioned earlier, uh, to go to Europa. It's called the uh, Europa Clipper. Yeah. That's the official name. Uh, and previously, uh, a while ago, when they were still in the pre-planning stages, they were talking about an orbiter and maybe having a lander. Um, but at this point, it's it's just looking like it is an orbiter. Uh, and the plan is to send the craft there. It'll orbit uh, 45 times. And it's also supposed to launch in the 2020s, which is when uh, Blank proposes this, this mission could also launch. 
Uh, and basically, uh, the reason that scientists and everyone is, is so excited about Europa, if you don't know, is because we know that it has a liquid water ocean. We've seen plumes shooting out uh, from underneath the icy surface. Um, so we have images and stuff like that. Uh, and everywhere on water, right, everywhere on Earth that there's water, there's life, um, which is a good indication that elsewhere in the solar system and in the cosmos where there's water, there's a high probability of finding alien life. So the easiest way to, to find that, obviously, is with a lander. Uh, the Europa Clipper mission is going to go measure uh, seismic activity uh, and things like that. But as far as really getting that hard, definitive evidence of life, um, I mean, the best way to do that is obviously with a lander. Um, so to that extent, uh, the mission, uh, assuming it, it does happen, would be uh, 6.5 years. That's what uh, Black's proposal is about. Uh, it takes roughly five years, he estimates, or it would take uh, five years for the launch at that timeline uh, to get to Europa. Uh, the lander would stay for approximately 35 days. Uh, the orbiter would go around for uh, three months or so uh, to get additional information on seismic activity. Um, and then eventually, when it was done, it would crash into the planet in order to uh, take measurements of the gas and things like that uh, around the moon. It's not a planet, it's the moon, um, as it went down. So that's basically it in a nutshell. Uh, so what do you think about, I mean... Attention on Europa is great, but the the Europa Clipper mission is sending, I mean, not necessarily a Europa orbiter, but something that's going to sort of sweep in and get close and then go back out and some kind of lander, although that potentially has been cut out of the budget from uh, with the new current NASA yeah. budget. Does it feel like it's like too many missions, like to this one place now? What do you think? I mean, there are um, a number of missions. At the same time, I think it makes sense to really focus on Europa because, again, on Earth, everywhere I find water, we found life. Um, there are some to be seems to be a scientific consensus that Europa is the best candidate for life in our solar system outside of Earth. So John Smith commented, um, because I've said everywhere we find water, we find life. Um, means the high probability of life on Europa. He said that's not very scientific. Um, I mean, I disagree with that. The way that science works is you make observations, you collect evidence, you form a hypothesis. The evidence that we have is that on Earth, where there's water, there's life. Um, therefore, I think it's a very valid scientific hypothesis that Europa, very high probability, uh, has life. Um, and to that extent, it, it makes sense to go there. I mean, look at how many times we've been to Mars. We have a number of rovers there. Yeah. Um, there are other missions that are planned, uh, which makes sense, again, because uh, if we're ever going to set up colonies on an alien world, except the moon, Mars is always the best candidate. Um, the other ones are way too hot, or way too cold, or gas giants, and we probably terribly. Um, but I think it makes sense to focus on those particular um, locations, Europa and Mars. They just you know, make sense in those respects. And with all of this attention, then maybe, you know, if one gets canceled, at least one will go. True as well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I've got, um, we've got sort of an interesting milestone happened this week. And I wanted to just quickly show this and then talk to you guys about this, which was that uh, NASA's Cassini spacecraft made its first flyby through the rings yeah. of, of Saturn. So sort of in between the uh, the rings and the planet itself, went through and took what are essentially the most close-up pictures of Saturn ever seen so far. And these are still kind of very raw pictures. But I just want to share these with you. Check this out. Let's see. So this is, that's the, uh, the southern vortex. Uh, and then sort of seeing the cloud tops. So it's just sort of on a loop here. And thanks, Jason Major uh, pulled this together and made it into an animation for us. So, uh, well, for everyone, but uh, it's, uh, and he got a lot of retweets. Holy cow, good job, Jason. Um, that's what happens when you turn something into an, an animation like that. But, so this is the beginning of the end for Cassini. We've got, uh, this is the sort of the first flyby to do this. It's got, I think there's another 20 planned. And then uh, in the end of, of September or middle of September, we're going to be saying goodbye to, to Cassini as it crashes into Saturn to, I guess, protect the icy worlds uh, for, uh, you know, the life, the potential life on the icy worlds around, around Saturn. Uh, how does this make you feel, Tim? Um, Cassini. 
Yeah. Well, starting um, to say goodbye to Cassini. Yeah, I mean, how how long has it been going now? Twenty years, almost. It's uh, I just wow. looked it up. Uh, Nineteen years and a hundred and ninety some odd days, actually, since its launch. It's been in orbit for about twelve years now. They've done one hundred and twenty five passes of Titan. They just did their last pass of Titan uh, again, like within the last couple of weeks. So. Um, and now it's just a matter of getting closer and closer into Saturn and, and ex exploring this region in between the rings. But, um, yeah, I yeah. mean, how do you I feel? I mean, that's, that's something that, that, that's something that's, that sort of gives you an idea of like how much there is to do in terms of space exploration, right? Like you talk about, should we send another mission to Pluto when we had a day to observe it? We've been, you know, casino has been running, been running for 20 years and it's yeah. still showing us new things. Like even with, without even updating the technology, it's not like we have a resolution problem. It's just that it, you just need so much data. Um, yeah. And now, now you have this opportunity to go you know, because it's, because it's getting into new areas because it's crashing down. It has, has the ability to explore new things. And it's like, well, clearly that there's, there's a lot that we still don't know. So. Yeah, I mean, Hopefully. I think that was the, in going back to that Cosmos Marathon, watching that, I mean, in 1980, uh, when they put it out, they were just showing off the first preliminary images that the Voyagers had taken of Jupiter. Hadn't even gotten to Saturn yet when they when they did that. And obviously, it hadn't even gotten mm. to Uranus and Neptune and seen all those places up close, but also just hadn't had the 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 in-depth information but now here we are we've had cassini at saturn for uh what was it since 2003 so like 14 years at saturn mm. just taking picture after picture after picture just delivering all this data I, that is i think going to be one of the great sadnesses for me is that we're just not going to have um a spacecraft at saturn for the foreseeable future there are no plans right now to send anything back to saturn and that just is, uh, you know, makes me sad. But it is, it's, it's the little engine that could, right? Yeah, like it, totally. It's, uh, it's surprising how often we send up te space telescopes and then, you know, s some small little internal gear gets broken, like, like happened with Kepler, for example, and it, like, it shuts down the entire thing. And, and most, most missions are designed for that, right? It's like, okay, maybe it'll go for half a year or maybe it'll observe 10 or 15 it passes around something and then something will go wrong or radiation will get it. So kudos to the engineers on that project for sure. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, I think we're sort of reaching the end of our hour and the end of our stories. Um, so Jolene, uh, why don't you let us know uh, where people can find out more? Um, so again, I am editor in chief at futurism.com. So it's F U T U R I S M.com. Uh, we write about, um, basically anything that's transforming society. So as I said, when I started, uh, artificial intelligence, CRISPR gene editing, uh, missions to, uh, Mars and Pluto and Saturn and all the lovely planets in our solar system. Uh, yeah. So if you like science and technology, that's where you find me. Futurism. Hooray. Absolutely. And, uh, you guys are are fearsome competitors. I'm uh, always, yeah, I'm, yeah. No, I think it's I think it's great though. Um, like the the more science communicators out there, the better. Uh, yeah. And the more good science communicators out there, even even better because it keeps you on your toes and stuff like that. Um, and ensures that you're you're really maintaining like sticking to the science. Um, because other people um, are out there doing it and doing it right. If you aren't, then people will go there. So fantastic. I'm all for it. Yeah. Um, Tim, where do people find out more? Um, Acapella Science on YouTube and on basically every other website where such things happen. Wonderful. Uh, now, a bunch of people have nominated you as a future panelist here on the Weekly Space Hangout. So, hmm. uh, so anytime, you know, I think like, you know, you're, you know, whenever you've got a new song coming out, you know, and it's going to relate to uh, maybe a story in the news, maybe we can figure out some way to bring you back and, uh, and have you uh, and have you talk about the story and maybe play a clip. But uh, well, I'd, I'd, I'd love to be back. I'm in my bedroom. So so much of the time, you know, working by myself. It's great to yeah. um, come out into the science world again. Tom's kicking around there somewhere, isn't he? Yeah, he's a uh, he's in the other room and occasionally in the chat box here. I he noticed that. About, <laughs> yeah, about he's my been conversations. Uh, so uh, yeah, it's funny. <laughs> yeah, awesome. 
All right, cool. So once again, I'm uh, Fraser Kane. If you haven't already, please subscribe to this channel, like this video, uh, and don't forget to come and join us at the Weekly Space Hangout crew. That's where you really join the sort of the inside of, of the fandom for the Weekly Space Hangout. They really are the executive producers of the show. So they're the ones who reach out, pick the guests, and get them here on the show and i'm i'm happy to interview so uh it's a it's a really great uh, group of people just go to wshcrew.space and uh and then all the information is there i'm going to put everyone back on the brady bunch view here and then we will all say goodbye there we go all right thanks Bye. everybody we'll see you all Bye. next week <laughs> so long you notice that this is backwards Check Which? this out. People, a few people notice this. So this one's reverse my my Pluto and Saturn thing, but in the this one, it's not reversed. Isn't Wait, that, what? Isn't that weird? What's reversed? In the show, people see these these the the text on these posters is backwards. Really? Because I I don't. No, you don't because you're in okay. the in in this with me, but everybody else does. So interesting. Yeah. Do people see me? Do you do you see my text back? No, nope. you probably nope. do. Eh? Nope, just mine. Huh. Interesting. Because <laughs> I yeah, I guess we're mir I'm mirrored to myself, but I'm not mirrored to you. Okay. So we're going to do uh, one last piece of note. We're going to do astronomy cast. Uh, that starts in half an hour. We're going to be uh, we're all going to be eclipse preppers. So how to prepare for the upcoming eclipse? We'll give you all the information. We will uh, we'll see you in thirty minutes over at astronomy cast. All right, now it's goodbye. Thanks everyone. Bye.